Shani Mutu's Serious Blooms at Night, Identity in Postcolonial Literature. I'm very excited that you've decided to read this very important novel of Caribbean literature. While this novel is challenging both in style and in subject matter, I hope you can learn to appreciate how wonderful this book is. In this video, I will touch on several important themes and characters. In the end, I will argue that Shani Mutu's novel explores the complexity of identity in a post-colonial setting. Serious Blooms at Night is one of those rare novels from the post-colonial world, which is written in English, that has been regarded as a milestone work. These types of works become extremely important because they raise literature to a new plateau in regards to subject matter, style, characterization, and ultimately importance. Just a few of these works include Tsi Tsi Dengarimba's Zimbabwean novel Nervous Conditions, which examines a character with an eating disorder in Africa, Anruhati Roy's Indian novel The God of Small Things, which addresses childhood trauma along with political upheaval in Kerala, India, Ben Okri's Nigerian novel The Famous Road, which uses magical realism to explore the consciousness of a spirit child facing ecological and spiritual destruction, and Carrie Holmes' New Zealand novel, The Bone People, which explores gender identification in the environment from a Maori perspective. One indication of their importance is the tremendous amount of literary scholarship they engender. For this presentation, I will not elaborate on the various topics that critics have concentrated on for Serious Blooms at Night. But I will say that since its publication, it has garnered over 50 critical essays or books. For Mutu, writing is largely a process of discovery. I usually start with some small thing, sometimes an image, sometimes a phrase. I do this kind of work so much that I'm constantly unconsciously creating, but what usually leads to a book is an image that grips me. I keep thinking about it. I want to know what led up to it, Mutu explains. I'll elaborate on this concept more soon in regards to serious blooms at night. Like your other mediums listed above, writing for Mutu borrows from other artistic endeavors. Everything you experience or read or hear from others becomes part of your artist's palette as a writer. But some images will grip you and others won't. Some suit your own longings or temperament, Mutu suggests. Taking this quote in mind, we can see the palette Mutu uses in Serious Blooms at Night, which not only has the backdrop of Trinidad with its flora, but also its subculture from the people of Indian descent living there. With this backdrop in mind, she certainly could begin to paint the images she remembered from her upbringing while inventing new ones, too. But of course, that compelling image is just the beginning. Then you have to find out what the story is, Mutu says. I write like a reader would read, not knowing what is coming. If I wrote out a plan for the book and I followed it, that would be easier, I think. But there will be no adventure, no mystery. I enjoy seeing how the story unfolds. Series plays out this way, where the reader is forced to take a journey with its characters. While this aspect can be challenging, I find that makes the book extremely effective. At the end of the discovery process, though, Mutu says she has to take control of the book she has written and fashion it into something. At this point, I can see a plan and a structure that works, but the plan comes very late in the writing process. I can't write an outline until the book is written, but then I can revise according to that plan to make it all work. This strategy makes for some powerful discoveries as you read this novel. Let me elaborate more on this discovery and writing process. In other words, she lets the creative processes lead her to create worlds, images, and people. From those associations, images emerge that a reader can grab and analyze and offer an interpretation that applies to his or her reading of the work. In particular, for a novel like Serious Blooms at Night, where there are so many unique characters and subtle themes, 
it is extremely important for readers to spend time processing and appreciating the nuances she brings out in the novel's world. While it may take a few readings to gather this appreciation, discovering its wonderful qualities can be transformative. Returning to how Mutu discovered the story of Sirius Blooms at Night, I want to offer the above quote. This scene, which gets recast several times in the novel, obviously refers to Mala slash Popo. She goes to say, I wanted to write the image down, but as it was, it was nothing more than a description. As I wrote, I began to feel the slightest nudge of familiarity with this woman, some unconscious knowing of her, and that this was the initial impulse toward a story. Who was she, and why was she doing this bizarre act in the kitchen? In discovering the story behind this image, Mutu begins to work through the traumatic experience she suffered growing up in Trinidad, as well as the plight of other people of Indian descent living there. Mutu explains that she is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. However, at the time she wrote the novel, her intention was not to tell about her own experience. I did not intend to fill her life, her story, but with my own personal story. It was long after the book was published, and I began to hear back from readers their own take on it, that I realized from what they were telling me that I had drawn on my own experience. In some instances, so very closely that I was telling my own story by imbuing Mala's life with mine. While it may have an autobiographical inspiration or overlap, the novel is a work of fiction that tells a story meant to connect to readers. Before moving into an analysis of the book, I want to offer some key ideas Mutu has said about a writing process. In the first quote above, I think she elaborates on the purpose of writing, not just fiction, but any type. Indeed, she explains, The first delight in writing for me is the invention of stories, situations, events, where I can impose my own vision of how things would be in that ideal world. My ideal world is not void of the lower states of existence, that is, of anger, hellishness, hatred, greed, etc. But in my ideal world, these states are outsmarted, or even getting the slip by good, truth, beauty, and innocence. Sirius Blooms at Night, as a version of our ideal world, triumphs in its ability. Hope you see how the good, truth, beauty, and innocence wins against the ugliness surrounding the characters. In the second quote above, I think Mutu defines the benefits of writing for her. She continues this idea. There's a reordering in my made-up worlds of fiction. does not attempt to pulverize bad, but is a way of permission. Permission to exist as a woman, a woman of color, as a lesbian, within, not on the outside of, the everyday world of society. This idea of permission, to use Mutu's word, can be substituted with other words such as agency, voice, power, reappropriation, or any other concept that returns authority and authenticity to peoples that have been underrepresented in literature or that have been forced to live in the margins of society. In trauma theory, such a reordering is often explained as remastering the narrative of the traumatic memories retaking control and ownership of the experiences to work through them and slowly overcome the pain associated with them. One of the most challenging aspects of the novel is its unique structure. As the slide above tells, the novel has five parts. These parts are keyed to the development and evolution of the main characters, Mala slash Popo and Tyler. There are other sections about more characters, but the five parts concentrate on this relationship between these two kindred spirits. The bug illustration dividers correspond to a key character in the book and his fascination with insects. These bugs also symbolize one of the key themes around how the seemingly insignificant creatures have profound importance and meaning despite the low expectations placed upon them by society. Upon my first reading of the novel, it was very difficult to notice how the book operated in regards to structure. 
However, it is important to see that the dividers help to move the story quickly, where they almost operate as vignettes on the way toward creating an entire story. These dividers also are important because they correspond to the psychological dimension within the characters. Although she does not reference the novel structure directly, Mutu offers a way to understand it. I use word-based storytelling to try to speak out my life, but not just to tell what has slash had happened to me, also to try to break down the world, even the pain and trauma of the world into smaller parts, that each are step-by-step -step logical, so that I and others might understand and rage against or sympathize with it. With this quote in mind, having the smaller sections without chapters provides readers with ways to cope with the difficult or unfamiliar content of the story. Another factor for the novel structure is the creation of an imaginary island of Montana Camara in the Island of Paradise. This imagined setting makes it easier for Mutu to tell a story that moves without the need for chapters. The background of the island and its inhabitants do not need exposition. Instead, we can focus on the characters and the trauma without the need to contextualize the real history of the island and its communities. Still, the novel is based on Trinidad. For more information on Trinidad and Tobago, please watch my videos on CLR James and VS Nepal on my YouTube channel. I have provided a short list of the main and minor characters in the novel. This list is not exhaustive, for there are more that I have left off. Despite his influence in the book, I have subjugated Mala and Asha's father, Chandan, as a minor character. He does not deserve to be included as a major slash main character, in my opinion. Now let me take some time to explain some aspects of certain characters. Nurse Tyler is the first character we are introduced to. Mutu makes him someone who does not fit the conventional expectations assigned to him in this culture. For instance, he is a male nurse, and a well-educated one at that. This position makes him an outcast among the other employees at Paradise Alms House. However, his questioning about his gender is the most important part of his character development. For instance, he recalls that his Bible-quoting Nana did not approve of him because, as Tyler narrates, I was not turning out to be boily enough for her church-going satisfaction. I think the implications of this remark is pretty obvious. However, I particularly love this line because it speaks to Mutu's subtle style and powerful language. The created adverb of boily is amazing because it shows that Tyler's questioning of his gender began even as a young child. Moreover, this word is a subtle jab to the conventions associated with cisgender identifications. Later, Tyler offers readers a more nuanced explanation of his gender. Over the years, I pondered the gender and sex roles that seemed available to people and the roles that went with them. After much reflection, I've come to discern that my desire to leave the shores of Lanta Camara had much to do with wanting to study abroad, but far more wanting to be somewhere where my perversion, which I tried diligently as I could shake, might be either invisible or of no consequence to people to whom my foreignness was what would be strange. I was preoccupied with trying to understand what was nature and what was perverse, and who said so and why. In many ways, Tyler's decision to leave is based on his struggle to understand his identity. On the other side, his return to the island is his way to try to gain acceptance, not only from others, but perhaps in himself. He wants to overcome the shame he feels in his homeland. Significantly, across many Caribbean islands, being gay is dangerous because they are targeted and persecuted for being themselves. Being gay is also illegal in many Caribbean countries. Through his storyline, Tyler is trying to make efforts to grow into whom he really is. He is directly in contrast to Shondon, the truly perverse character in the novel. The irony within the society is that Tyler is considered the perversion, while Shondon is treated only as a sad drunk. Because of his outward expression of his sexuality and his gender, Tyler does not fit into mainstream society. 
Chandon, whose sexual obsession is secretive, is truly the perverse monster in the book. Remember that while there are rumors surrounding Chandon's character, Myla suffers the most from those whispers and jeers. Before moving to Myla, I want to offer a brief evaluation of Chandon. He does not deserve a lot of attention here. His backstory is telling, however. Abandoned by his biological parents, Chandon is given to Reverend Thoroughly, a name that drips with symbolism. During his formative time in his life, Chandon learns to hate his heritage and begins to mimic the colonial culture. This phenomenon is called hegemony. This belief plays out in the novel in the following quote. In his innocence, he felt that his people's lack of things, home decor, was a result of apathy and a poverty of ambition. He thought of his parents' mud house and the things there. The piras they used for sitting on, the rough planks of wood used as shelves, the karyas instead of mattresses of high wood frames, the enamel wares, the paltry pitch oil lamps, and most saddening of all, the latrine with that particular odor that etches itself onto one's brain. He felt immense distaste for his background and the people in it. Notice that because of the colonizer's influence, Chanda finds a poverty of ambition and a tremendous shame of his upbringing and heritage. As a reaction to this, Chandan tries to become a mimic, the perfect pupil, and what he hopes to be the perfect son. This is impossible and turns into a devastating self-hatred. The narrator elaborates. Embers of adoration and desire smoldered for Lavinia, but what sprang up were flames of anger and self-loathing. He began to hate his looks, the color of his skin, the texture of his hair, his accent, the barracks, his real parents, and at times, even the reverend and his god. Later, this hatred for Lavinia and her leaving becomes the fuel for his abuse of his daughters. But the self-hatred and his hegemony are not, I repeat, are not reasons to perpetuate his abuse. When looking at this scene through Tyler's character, we can see that Tyler is trying to avoid his own internal hatred. By avoiding self-hatred, Myla and her new identity of Popo are resisting and surviving pressures, abuses, and forces conspiring against her slash them. Indeed, I think this strength speaks to the power of her character. When we first meet her, she is unable to speak, but she can make bird and insect sounds. This latter ability shows that she is not someone who has lost her voice. Instead, she decides to abandon the language of oppression and communicate with things that cannot hurt or disappoint her. As mentioned earlier, Tyler and she share a spiritual connection, one that Tyler notices. Miss Ranchanda and I, too, have a camaraderie. We have found our own ways and fortified ourselves against the rest of the world. Myla's strongest protection against abuse, besides the talismanic snail shells and the overall nature around her, is the creations she makes up in her imagination. Most significantly, another self in Popo which returns to, to the bug theme of the novel, hence the modified use of the word poopa. Mutu's, Mutu walks the readers through this process later in the book. Still, this new self protects Mala. The narrator hints toward this idea. Popo began to tingle with a sensation of delirious omnipotence. She was able to find her way to survive in the dark, to name plants and insects with only their scent or brush against them as her clues. This omnipotence represents the strength Myla has always had and wanted to show but could not because of the terrible trauma she endured. In many ways, Myla can stand in for many peoples surviving a colonized experience. I'll let Mutu offer one more thought about this character. Mala, the main character in Sirius, is not, as everyone in the novel thinks, a mad woman. But she is someone who has found extraordinary ways to survive. This quote reminds us that we have to examine characters like Mala with careful and empathetic attention. I'll conclude this slide with some wise words from L.C. Muhandi, 
Otto's mother, who reminds her son that, quote, almost everybody in this place wish they could be somebody or something else, end quote. No truer sentence belongs in this book. Before I leave you, I want to offer a few themes to consider. The theme statements in the above slide are complete statements to discuss from the novel. Please notice that theme is not a one-word topic such as survival, love, revenge, or a type of conflict such as man versus man or man versus nature. A theme should be considered a complete sentence. I will leave it up to you to continue a development of one of the themes. However, I will offer a brief discussion of how nature, particularly the serious plant, operates as a symbol for Mala. This plant is described constantly to indicate to the reader its symbolic importance. If I were to prove this idea slash theme, I would want to offer many quotes about it to support that idea. For instance, its odor reminds Mala that life can still go on. The narrator explains, the scent of decay was not offensive to her. It was not the aroma of life refusing to end. It was the aroma of transformation. Such odor was proof that nothing truly ended, and she reveled in it as much as she did the fragrance of serious blossoms along the back wall of the house. Finding solace in the decaying smell of nature, which is aligned here with the perfume of the serious plant, Mala sees that nature can transform death into life. The fact that she reveled in this association confirms her feelings about nature. It speaks to her desire to keep living despite her circumstances. Hopefully this small example can provide you with a model to develop theme and an interpretation of the novel. While I could continue to elaborate on the novel and could explore many different critical angles, I will conclude this presentation with a few words from Mutu. She describes writing this novel, her first, as thrilling. And what was so thrilling was drawing out frame by frame, rather than a generalized way. Why? And that is the most important thing. Why? Why? What happens, happens. I love Mutu's cinematic metaphor in that quote because we can see the development of themes and characters over the course of the novel in moments in our relationships that slowly materialize as we pay attention. The quote in the slide above, though, is perhaps the most important to me, because, in essence, literary criticism, critical thinking, and or deep reading revolves around trying to answer why things happen in a book. I hope you'll be able to answer some of the key questions you have about serious blooms at night. Please consult these sources to learn more about the book and the author.